Uh, good morning. Um, let me begin by thanking the organizers for this session. It's, uh, it's been absolutely fascinating and a privilege to be here. Uh, those of you who know me uh, will realize it's quite difficult for me to keep still. Uh, so I'll be tethered to the plinth, um, waving my arms. Um, so my, my presentation is called Meeting Archaeological Assemblages Halfway. And I'm very influenced by feminist philosophers like Karen Barrett and Donna Haraway. So for me, um, reflective practice, uh, looking at myself, is useful, uh, but diffractive but I, it reflects back its sameness, you see? So it, I don't get, it's, it's not as rich as the Baradian point of view, which is diffractive, where you look at your practices and behavior and how you come to know through other practices. So my interest is in um, practice-based research, and I suppose I should give you a definition of an assemblage. I'm going to talk about Paradata 2, and I can make this thing work. Paradata for me is the archaeological assemblage. So if you think of an assemblage, and starting with Matt at the beginning, and he has this wonderful expression of the, the real world pushes back. So in archaeology in the field, we see coming out of it hegemic reports of what we found. But in fact, my position is that the activities of archaeologists and the tools, the people and the, ma the matrix of materials they encounter mark one another with paradata. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that as we move forward. So my work will be based on uh, a site in North Wales in the Cluidian Hills, which is in a very beautiful part of uh, North Wales. And it's called Bodvari. And I'm actually going to present my conversation with a number of artists whom I have been diffracting my work through on this excavation. And I'll introduce them as we come along. So I'm going to talk about two illusions. The provenance illusion, excavation reports are full of photographs and drawings documenting aspects of excavations. The data will be accompanied by metadata describing the data. More reflexive analysis will also contain paradata, which is data describing the conditions and circumstances of how the data were recorded and why decisions were made. Now, of course, you could always say, well, I need another layer of data to describe why I think that paradata is interesting. So I call that peridata. And so you build up these onion effect of looking back in yourself about why things were done. So there's a certain amount of um, contention between the paradata and the data. You, the reflexive part makes it very difficult to understand. If I stop now to analyze what I'm doing, I've stopped doing what I was doing. So there's a gap appearing. So if you look at this picture, which I call the provenance illusion, here are two of my colleagues. So this is Stefan Gantz. He's a, an artist. His practice is drawing-based, extended drawing, he calls it. And the, the guy with the, the camera is, Stephen, is Simon Callery. And his practice is painting. And the two uh, Chilean volunteers there are uh, workers on the excavation. So in this picture, you can see two people being observed by me observing the people who are doing the observing. So, the, so I'm watching Simon and Stefan, and they are observing Camille and Sophia, and Sophia are recording the sites. Now, what are they recording? I would like to draw your attention at this point to the great big hole they sat in. So what we get as a re record of that trench often looks like this. So one is an ortho photograph, and the other is a standard section drawing that you would see in many excavation reports. Now, the section drawing, I'll draw your attention to two things. All these drawings are of things which are still there. We are recording the excavation, but all our records are of things that are still there. 
that section is the bit we didn't dig. So we always look at the archaeological sites as a series of veneers or layers, and the archaeology is always there as a whole. And all the material that was once there is mostly broken up and thrown on a spoil heap. Small piece is in bags, and some of it is embodied in the memory of our, of our bodies and our, and our minds. The illusion is taken to perfection, if I could just move away from the microphone for a moment, and draw your attention to these lines. So, a layer, an archaeological layer, is like this, and then another layer is like this. In that drawing, we draw the, the thing that is between the two things, the nothingness, which is the interface. So we are presenting the absence, and the material that we're recording is blank. So the archaeology and the archaeologists have now completely disappeared. This is the provenance illusion. So what I'm trying to provoke you to think about is how do we know our way through the data? And the reason I'm interested in working with the artists is one, they're really great people to work with, but two, they challenge me to think about what I'm doing. And in return, I question those. So with these, these gentlemen, I've written Simon and Stefan and some other artists I'll introduce, we work together on site and we have conversations and we affect each other's works and each other's practices and but we have deep discussions and to talk about these issues. So how else, how do we get back to the material that was, that was there before? Now here's one way of looking at it. So Stefan is, has recorded a section. So this is his version of a, a section. Now what's happened here is he's decided to do micro stratigraphy and he has a video camera and he's gone down the side of a section and recorded every grain of soil and taken the colour out of it and then so it's a point measurement on a micro stratigraphy down that same trench and now he's extruded it to create the sectional layer and you get all these colours. You don't see the interfaces I showed you before but that is a representation of a section. Simon, his practice is painting. His recent practice is using what he calls contact painting. And he comes on site and he uh, places his canvases onto the material the latest surface is working on. And he sort of traces around what's on there and cuts it out. So in his contact painting, you can see these. He's, he's now flattened the layers out on his canvas, but he's kept the idea of the stratigraphy in that he has layers. So these paintings are multiple layers deep. And the, the rips and the gesture to the, the fill of material and prior layers. So these are two completely different perceptions of exactly the same set of material taken at the same time when I'm working there as an archaeologist. Now, so bear in mind, Stefan went from a point to a line. Simon has now gone from a line to a plane, if you think of this in terms of archaeological graphics. Uh, okay, I'm trying to make this go forward and it's stopped. Let me see if I can do it here. Ah. So, um, now I want to try and get to putting back some of the uh, morphology of these 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 skins that we're, we're creating. In this case, here is a, a, a layer, this is a drawing, we can see the topographic data onto which Stefan has mapped some information, which this is actually acoustic information about troweling motions. I'll come back to that in, in a minute. Um, but you can see, it's still got great big holes in it. Most of the archaeology is still not there. So I'll just remind you of uh, our drawing processes. So. We use lots of drawing processes at Badvari and that's part of our practices. Some of them are uh, sketching, we do uh, recordings, we do automated recordings, um, we do abstractions, um, like this Harris matrix. Both these things are drawn on the fly when we're, you know, we're interpreting, interpreting the archaeology. And we draw it as we're going there. I often have visitors around and I have a ranging rod and I say, look at that, and we hear Jesse about people scribing on the, the surface to draw the sections. So the drawing and the embodied interaction and trying to remember 
what we're going through and the materiality and this pushing back of the real world. We've tried to capture it, but we fail in this, I think, in, in the two dimensions. But in the process of looking at that, we discovered that um, artists and archaeologists share a number of things in terms of the drawing practices. So troweling becomes a drawing practice. And why, what I mean by that is the word draw embodies you throwing your arm out and then pulling it back to you. So a pen, you're in a life drawing room, you pull it back this way. If you're a troweler, you're pulling it this way. So their embodied drawing is one of these ideas. And if you look at the vocabulary of what drawing is, other things start to emerge. So to draw, to outline, to trial, like say, is a drawing process. And there are other things which we can say are drawing. We chase, we define, we delineate, we demarcate, and so on and so forth. Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, did a, um, a deep analysis of some uh, wordplay in, in the German word of Ries. Ries has other connotations. And if you have, it also means to breach, to cleft, or to bring forward. And th this is, I think, was the value of the, uh, the process of drawing, this, this reaching into the data, the embodied process of bringing data. So if we if you hold that idea back and I bring your mind back to the void I showed you at the beginning, if we were drawing the archaeology, it should look like that. So Stefan is showing the embodied movements, the strokes and that, and it's come out of itself. So, so you can see why I'm playing games, but you're here, your mind's here trying to get back into the, the archaeology itself. Now notice I'm using the word the archaeology. For me, the archaeology is the matrix. And that matrix is the material in the ground, the tools that we use, and the people who are using the tools. And they all mark each other. So the application of a very wide range of mark making, so I expand the idea of drawing to mark making and gestures, allows us to respond to material in different ways. And I made this remark about we mark each other. So we do. So I inscribe and erase at the same time in a, troll, in a troweling gesture. The material makes a mark on the blades of my trowels. And both those things leave a mark and impression and memory in my muscles. So we're interacting. So we became interested in what is this embodied practice? And so let me just hand over to Stefan for a moment. And I want to draw your attention to this quote. Helen uh, Wick said, who's very interested in drawing practices, wondered if we could excavate the relations among our gestures and traces to analyze their stratigraphy. And I thought this was a fascinating question. And Stefan and I have been looking at how we might do this. So here's Stefan recording some of the guys on, on the trench. He has, a, this is video, digital video and sound recording. And we, we look at the, the marks that come back and the marks are multimodal. And when I, when I mean multimodal, they're, they're not always ocular centric. We rely on haptic feedback, we rely on acoustic feedback and so on as practice based researchers. Right. There's no sound there, but what I wanted to do here is pick up this word from Ruth Tringham. She has this very evocative way of describing the embodied practice. She calls it hand ballet. And I just, this is just fantastic. This is the, the way your body knows to, to find things in the ground. So while I, what, what, what we should, I'm afraid you can't hear at the moment. While this is going on, I'm talking about chink, 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 and, and the sounds are changing. Most people in the field will know about this. As you, it, when I, I try to teach excavation to students when I, we have some of our excavations. A lot of them will never get it. And it's partly because I can't convey quickly enough or, or, or eloquently enough what we are actually doing in this embodied practice. But in this case, what I was talking about is can you hear what's happening? Can you hear the change and the, the chink and things? So this provoked a different type of question. But how do we represent this assemblage, which is the tool, the archaeologist, and the matrix. So here's one way of looking at it. So this is a sonic, sonic stratigraphy. So Stefan has, is recording what's happening here. And you can see the structure here. So this is the, the tones and the rhythms, the cadence, 
have distinctive signatures. This is the signature of the stratigraphy, the digger and the tool represented back at you. In, in, and these are the layers, and they have different characteristics. So it's just a, a very different way of understanding the materiality that we're engaged with. I just want to exp I'm going to jump ahead, so I, I want to make some statements about gestures. So this thing about drawing and gestures and knowing it by moving, Stefan started analysing some of our activities. And in drawing theory, you can analyse how pictures are brought together. You can analyse how um, developed and sophisticated the drawing is by analysing the gamuts, the, 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 the shapes, the phrasing, the linear phrasing, how things spring from one another. This could be analysed by a drawing theorist and they, they could see, we can begin to see when we look at, I'm not going to show this, it's not meant to be surveillance. If you look at someone who is new to digging, the strokes are quite different, the sort of tentative little things. With these big sweeping gestures, you know that I'm trying to catch a, a surface, to catch a, detect something that's happening in the ground. But the stratigraphy of my gestures has been lost. So I turn to... Um, I went back to Stefan, I said, Stefan, you've lost the stratigraphy. He goes, ah. So he then built, he, he marked the, the beginning of my trial stroke, and he made it material, and then he put it on top of each other. So the stratigraphy, so this is showing each of my, this case, this is my trialing stroke, and he called it his drawing, which I took exception to. So this is embodied practice, but notice what's happened here. I've gone from a movement to a virtual thing, and now it's physical. So we're now coming to, I'm going to introduce the idea of fidgetal, which is we go from a digital to a physical outcomes of what we're doing. So this is creating uh, ontological steps in how that material is now being changed. It's now gone, it's been dematerialized, but it's presence by the, the flow of my movements. And what this, so this is a kind of paradox. So this is recording the context of me collecting my data. So it's, a, it's aesthetic paradata, which can be analysed. So, as I said, Stefan got this far, um, and I'll, there's another illusion this, which I'll come back and explain later. Um, that is represents in RTI reflectance transformation imaging. Um, so what I'm doing here is showing the, the light to show the. This is the. Uh, you can see more detail if you change the lighting. But I've, I've now re-virtualized the digital data that he had. So our practices are now well and truly entangled in terms of artistic and archaeology in practice-based research. How am I doing for time? Five. Right. I'm at the right slide. So I want to introduce the second illusion. So this is RTI in action. This is based on some research I did in 1985. And it was Martin Biddle and Bertha Colby Biddle were doing excavations in Winchester uh, on the old Saxon Minster. What they found in 1964 or so was a hole. It was a robbed out trench and the, the, archa the physical building was no longer there. There was a ghost in the footprint. However, they had a, a reimagination and they wanted to convey that reimagination. They came to, to IBM as I was working for research then and how we could do that. And we built a, a geometric hypothesis of what we thought it might have looked like. And that um, model was moved as a video shown in the British Museum. But it was written in proprietary code and it disappeared. We wanted to bring that code back to life. People kept on asking me about it. So we found the code by miracle. Uh, it's on proprietary systems, but we managed to translate it. The short story is we translated it into a modern system and we were able to 3D print the new outcome. So we made it physical again. So this is this type of thing, 3D printed. Uh, and this is an RTI of the, the object. What I want to do quickly is that flashing light is key to understanding this thing. What happens in RTI is you have a fixed object, a camera, and you have a flash. These two keep together and the flash goes click, 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 and the dot, the flare, tells you where the camera is and you can extract the geometry or the surface normals of the shape, which is why I can create that illumination. However, if you look very closely at these pictures, my paradata, my colleague 
Ian Dawson, a sculptor in Winchester School of Art, is also captured there. So in between the frames, I'm capturing the context of how I'm capturing the data by auto-archiving the paradata within my, within my actual practice. But did you see the, the illusion? You think you're looking at a photograph. But when I did the RTI, I changed the ontology of the object yet again. So the RTI is measuring the surface normals of the object. You're no longer looking at a photograph. You're looking at an image processing system of the geometry of an object that was there. So the object is now, so the archaeology has once again disappeared into a polynomial assemblage. So, well, I'd like to draw out a couple of conclusions from this. As we work through our paradata, we need to also consider the ontological implications of thinking through a material thinking. Sensorial archaeology, our cross-modal practices, are important, and we don't really capture those today, but they do auto-archive, and they are evocative of the excavator, the invisible digger, our tools, our practices, the marks, and they can be reconceptualized as art, paradata, and creative way marks of how we got through the archaeology. I also contend that the cross-disciplinarity, the diffraction of this is important because it shows the differences rather than the sameness of what we're doing in our practices. And the critical analysis of the whole assemblage relationally, including the tools, the people, is required for a fuller archaeological record to emerge. And I would just leave you with the thought that this digital nexus, which we're only beginning to understand, is disrupting that practice, our sensorial practices, our ways of knowing and the archaeological records. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, does anyone have a, a question? If I... <laughs> Hello, Paul. Good morning. I would have lots of questions if I really understood uh, the digital ways you have to record your data. Unfortunately, I have no idea, but I loved your work. Congratulations. <laughs> I love your visualizations, information visualization of processes, sounds, uh, place. Uh, but the problem, I suppose, for archaeologists, even for other people, is how to read. Um, I, I, some, some of the business uh, uh, experiments show that people can't uh, read, even 3D. So how do you actually make this readable to people? Uh, the purpose of the, the research is, is, is actually partly reflective and partly refractive to, to draw attention to this missing aspect of our work. Now, I completely agree with you and understand that uh, people can't read. And I, I did mention that m many of my students will never get this process. However, if we don't engage, this, might, this type of research may go nowhere. Uh, however, we don't ask the questions, we don't dig deeper into that, we won't have the conversation, so this, this is a step on the way. But I do fully appreciate your point that we have to have multiple, multiple modes of communicating because we perceive in different ways. Uh, um, hello, everybody. I'm Jana from Slovakia. Thank you uh, for this interesting uh, speech. Like I'm architect, it's um, important to draw well, <laughs> to show my images to the others. <laughs> and um, what I want to say, something sometimes I'm hesitating if um, to draw a reconstruction, it's better than to do a 3D model. Because sometimes when you draw by hand, by hand, it's um, closer to the people. 3D reconstructions are very, um, it's not so personal, 
So I'm hesitating about the technique, for example. <laughs> and also if it's uh, good to draw some uh, hypothetical reconstruction of a ruin, because if somebody saw a ruin, have different imagination. And why I show my imagination if we are not sure if it's good? So it's uh, the question, but not for your presentation, but in general, the question is um, if uh, we are not sure about the shape of the building that um, doesn't exist anymore, if we should show our <laughs> idea to the others when we are not sure. So maybe if we show some hypothetical forms, it's better, I think. And, or we, we left some place for the imagination of the people. <laughs> so it's a question maybe for some other workshop. <laughs> Thank you. Could I, could I respond to that first before anyone else does? Um, my claim to fame or shame, depending on which way you look at it, is I coined the word virtual archaeology in the 1980s through that type of thing. When I coined the phrase, it was not about reconstructions. It was never meant to be reconstructions. It was meant to be about understanding the processes of doing archaeology. The virtualness was the doing, not the imagination, the reimagination. So please. Um, Forgiveness. What I said, um, it's true that I didn't understood at all. But um, you use the word ontological. Uh, it seems to me that it's correct, but uh, it would be simpler for uh, other colleagues of ours uh, to speak about an epistemological rupture uh, relating to those uh, years of last century. Um, I, I would prefer, because you spoke about ontological and it means that we would have a huge fight <laughs> in, in, in terms of uh, archaeology, it doesn't mean the period, uh, it could be recent prehistory, it could be medieval or modern uh, epochs, doesn't matter. What is really, uh, for me, from my point of view, is that you managed to show us how you develop a new way of understand our work that um, is really an epistemological rupture in related to the what 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 everybody does in the world nowadays. That's all. That, Anna. The, the, um, so in terms of the epistemological rupture, I mean, I get that, I do get that, but I'm deliberately provocative about the ontological thing because I think we spent too much time looking at the epistemology and we're archaeologists and it's a material-based practice, so we should be at least spending some of our time looking at the being of archaeology and the ontology, but I do, I do accept your point. There's another question at the back. Hi, uh, this, yeah. Hi uh, my name is Mary. Um, I love this talk. It was beautiful to see it here. Um, one of the things I particularly liked is the many different ways you had of capturing all of the sensorial um, and embodied um, uh, practices that are involved in excavation and and using the, the the way the different artists like capturing the sound. I just I just loved that. Um, and it's absolutely true that that sort of illustrates the way that um, uh, knowledge is produced through the em embodied, you know, practices of the archaeologists. And I'm curious, um, and I just want to sort of ask you if you have any ideas. I'm very interested right now in thinking about how part of the embodied em em ways in which knowledge is produced through the archaeologist's body involves um, using their emotions and using their affect and using a sense of imagination and empathy. And I, I just want to sort of 
challenge you, is there any way you can imagine to capture that, uh, either artistically or in these similar kind of ways, um, that you're capturing the sounds and the, uh, the physical movement and the inscriptions on the body? I would love to have a way to capture the emotion that's also an embodied part of archaeological practice. Thank you. That is, I mean, thank you very much. The, um, I have some ideas. Um, this picture uh, is, if you were t Tim Ingold, you would say it was a mesh or a network. And what it shows is a moment of tension and a moment of decision, or you think it does, because those lines record where my trowel hit the ground, so the trowel, me, and the matrix have come into together. My embodied action, and when I'm making the decisions, my unthought decisions, my, the, the cognition which is buried away somewhere else and maybe in my body, if you track the ductus of my entire movement, that decision about where the trial is going to go next and hit the ground is somewhere out here. So in fact, what I need to do is track that and these will become knots, not meshes. And in that you might get some of that embodied uh, fluidity. That's my next project, maybe, if I can find someone to work with me. But thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, I also, uh, it's Matt Edgeworth here. Um, I also loved your talk, Paul. And uh, this idea of troweling as a drawing practice, it certainly is, but it's also um, an erasive practice as well. And in your description of when the trowel meets the matrix, so to speak, we are certainly creating these marks on the ground and leaving our traces there. But then with the very next scrape of the trowel, we rub them out again. And um, it seems that there's this dual action going on, this creation of marks, and then the rubbing them out. And somehow the successful troweler masters this to such an extent that when you uh, take the photo of the evidence or, or draw the section, there seems to be almost like magically no trace of the trowler <laughs> there at all, although they've actually played such an amazing role in creating it. So bringing to light these kind of drawing of marks and things, you're, you're kind of going beyond that. So it's really bringing something to light that would otherwise be hidden, you know. So, thank Thanks you. for that observation. The, one thing I didn't say, it was um, Maurice Murphy the other night pointed this out to me. Um, what I think this represents is intangible cultural heritage, the art of archaeology. And it, I think it's a valid thing to study. Um, we study hurling, we study baseball, we study tennis, intangible, why not troweling? <laughs>